There it goes. Going live. You we're were, live. You were close. We are live. Hey, look, I reappeared. It's magic. Lance, Lance on the video, if you're listening to the, the podcast on <coughs> some uh, platform, Lance has been disappearing from the video. We're so. uh, employing movie effects on this video. Yeah. Special effects. But if you're watching on YouTube, you see that we're in the middle of a remodel. Um, right? Is that what we're calling This is a, a major. Remodel? We have taken a good chunk of our warehouse and turned it into a studio. So we've been uh, procuring the, <laughs> the latest of Portuguese oaks to build the wall. <laughs> yeah. yes. Boom. I think Portugal is known for cork more than oak. I know. That's, I just made that up. Oh. <laughs> just roll with me. Sorry. Yes. Uh, Portuguese. Oak. Portuguese oak. Anyway, um, this is episode eight of the Fly Fish Food podcast. And we were talking amongst ourselves for a, trying to figure out a topic. And we wanted to talk about still waters. Still waters meaning what? Water that's still? <laughs> you stay extremely still as you fish in the water. Yeah, okay. I, meaning lakes, ponds, that's reservoirs. Non-running water, right? Yeah, so, not moving water. Not rivers. Could still have a little bit of current, wind currents and things, but not a river. Yep. Wind current, not a river. <clears throat> One of the reasons why we decided to, to do this topic is it's a really good way to diversify your fishing, to learn some new techniques. And I know that Curtis and I, over the past five years or so, have really kind of revamped our whole approach to still waters. So... Um, we'll share some experiences there. Lance is a able, no, he only Euro nymphs, right? That's what everybody tells me. <laughs> yeah, and Lance is also taller than me now. Well, only when I'm on a, uh, this chair is as low as it gets. I just, well, if I get too much lower, then my beautiful oh face yeah. is hidden by this microphone. That's when we get people saying, um, We'd really love to see Lance's face. Can we face. get Lance to sit on a pillow, please? <laughs> <laughs> Just like he was doing when he was driving. All right. <laughs> so Stillwaters. Um, how long have you been fishing Stillwaters, Lance? I know you started as a river guy, right? Yeah, I think the first Stillwater I fished was, well, I don't know. The first, I mean, I've been fishing Stillwaters with bait and things since I was a youth. But fly fishing, <clears throat> I, I think the first time I Stillwater fished with a fly rod, was probably in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, somewhere in there. Um, but I didn't have any idea what I was doing. Yeah, same here. I, uh, I think my first go at Stillwater fly fishing was over in the, the basin where I grew up. And luckily there's a whole bunch of dumb fish over there. Bunches. <laughs> yeah. So got into it there and... Uh, Usually it would be that I would take a like a seven and a half foot spinning or no like a seven foot spinning rod and a bunch of spinners out, catch as many fish as I thought I needed to catch that day, and then I would suffer through fly rod fishing, hmm. maybe catch one or two. I wasn't any good at it. What about you, Curtis? Um, old man. So when I when I was in college, I worked at a fly shop, and uh, the guy did a lot of still water, and I always considered it Jedi fishing. Because I, in my mind, it's like, you go into this huge lake, how do you even begin to dissect it and know where to go? Mm -hmm. And what depth and where the fish are. It's, to me, it seemed like just a shot in the dark. So for that, I shied away from, you know, other than mountain lakes, I'd fish. Uh, my first time I ever caught a fly on of my own making was... A fish? Or a, a fish, fly? yeah. <laughs> I was a fish, say. I caught a fly with chopsticks. Was it a house uh, fly? In the eight, it was 1984 with uh, Mr. Miyagi. Right. Uh, first fish on a fly I tied was fly and bubble on a high mountain lake. And so I did a lot of high mountain lake stuff after I started getting into tying. I had, uh, but it was really limited to just ants and beetles and dry fly kind of stuff. It wasn't really what I would consider still water. But I learned the error of my ways and became a Padawan Jedi for all you Star Wars nerds. <laughs> Okay, for all you non-Star Wars nerds, he learned how to, to fly fish in lakes. 
So some of the comments, we opened this up earlier on Facebook and, and Instagram when we started gathering some questions and you know some of the, the challenges like Curtis was saying is Jedi fishing. You're in a big body of water. Um, how do you move around and, and access a lot of the water that holds fish? How do you find where the fish are? How do you choose a rod? How do you choose a line? How do you choose your flies, your leader? Um, there's there's a lot that goes into it that, that will help you to become a better stillwater angler. So we're just going to kind of break down these, uh, these topics one by one. And uh, also, if you have questions or comments, feel free to, to do that on, on the YouTubes. I'm monitoring the comments. That's why I keep looking down at my Are my there computer. any coming in? Yeah, we my, do have comments. Okay, good. My little thing is not refreshing the chat. But. Somebody's saying, Bill, Phil or Brian better be on the show. Phil or Brian? Who are they? We don't even like bobbers. We love you, <laughs> Phil and Brian. Brian said, or sorry, Brian needs to come. Phil, you were supposed to come back after yeah. our last trip. Yep. It's, so, it's Phil's fault. So Phil will join us. Phil's fun. By those first names, they mean Brian Chan, Phil Rowley. Yeah. Yeah. For right. those uninitiated in the still water realm. We do. If you go uh, search our channel, we have a live stream we did with Phil. So right. uh, it was very educational, but uh, entertaining. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So give us a thumbs up on the comments if you can hear us and everything. I think we have like 30 more episodes before we have to dial that down. 28. Right. But 28. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're we'll, running out. But oh, this yeah. should be decently dialed in. Decently dialed. We finally upgraded our lights. We upgraded our camera. We have a real legit backdrop. I mean, it's so real. Portuguese. Portuguese. Portuguese oak. oak. And Lance got a get tall seat. <laughs> so, all right, first things first. Uh, when people think uh, fishing in lakes or fly fishing, they talk about rods. When I first started out, I just used the nine foot five weight that I had because it was the, the one that I, I could use. What do you guys think about rods? I know that my rod selection changed a bit when I started fishing the way that Lance twisted our arms and started making us fish, but what do you guys think? Well, I started with a five weight as well, and I quickly outgrew it because I was finding it <clears throat> Or at least for me, too difficult to fight the bigger fish. Maybe that was just my fighting methods, but uh, so I did go with a nine foot six weight after that, and that kind of became my standard. And then I ended up getting a Scott S3, nine and a half foot six weight. I remember that which one. Which is this was a stellar rod, and I only went for nine and a half. I don't even remember why, but I loved it. I loved the extra reach. And I think they were demos, and I got a nine footer. Oh yeah, and that's you, right. You stole the nine and a half footer yeah, before so I could get to. Yeah, it was kind of them. luck of the draw. Yeah, yeah, but <laughs> um, that one became my go-to still water. Um, and then Lance forced us to well, go I like am ten bigger footers. than both of you, as they can <laughs> see on the So tell us what what your ideal still water rod is for most things. I think like you guys, so just going back, I mean, most people that are entering still water, if you're already into it, you probably have a dedicated still water rod. If you don't, then like most anglers, you have a nine foot, four, five, six, something like that, based on where you uh, where you do most of your fishing. And that will work, right? You caught fish yeah. on your nine foot five weights will take fish. Uh, but if you, if you get into still water fishing, like you're talking still water, generally speaking, produces larger fish, not always, but generally, generally speaking. Yeah. The fish don't have to fight current. They have access to lots of food, um, long growing seasons, on and on and on. So fish in still water tend to be a little bigger. Uh, you tend to throw slightly larger flies. You know, a lot of people are throwing woolly buggers and leeches and minnow imitations. So it, it's natural to get a slightly heavier rod. My ideal setup is I tend to like longer rods too. A, a 10 foot six weight would be my ideal lake setup. Um, now, why do you like a 10 footer? 10 footer, I'm fishing out of a boat a lot or a flow tube a lot. And uh, when you're sitting, uh, that extra reach gives you a better cast. It keeps your line off the water, just you know, raises your cast up just another foot, which if you're on a still water, especially when it's flat calm uh, and you're casting, one, one side tip here is you don't want to lay your line on the water and then water load again and then lay your line on the water and water load. You're just basically sending out a signal to all the fish within your casting range that says, 
here, there's trouble over here. Run away! Yeah, run away. So, you, you know, if it's choppy, that's less of an issue. But still, anytime you can lessen the surface disturbance you're creating, that's a good thing. In a competition, when I draw a boat partner that can't cast, and they're over here, I'm casting as far that way as I can. Because if, <laughs> if you cast right down the center, you're just... You're experiencing all those scared fish. So when we go fishing with Lance, that's why he's always on the other side of the lake. Uh, right. Not always, just usually. <laughs> no. yeah, so cause... you just want to keep that line up off, and that extra length helps with that. It also helps with the uh, with a technique we call the hang, where you're casting a sinking line usually, or a midge tip type line, something where you're fishing subsurface, and the flies reach their deepest depth, and at the end of the retrieve, they go from kind of pulling slightly horizontal to lifting more vertical. And you, a longer rod allows you to fish that hang, that uh, transition time further away from the boat and lift more line, just like if you were Euro nymphing, that longer rod is an advantage there. So it's, it's kind of a double edged sword for me, but I, I or not double edged sword, but a double uh, advantage there. I like both those things the extra reach and just being able to hang farther. And then having, I fish a lot of three fly rigs. So that, uh, to do that, I like to space my flies out, which means you have. Uh, a long, long leader, and to be able to fish a long leader, it's easier with a longer rod. You can, with a longer rod, you can fight the fish from a longer leader and get them up closer and still have leverage. Versus if you had an eight and a half foot rod and you're fishing a three fly rig, your top fly would get to the tip top and you wouldn't be able to land those fish as easily. Yeah, right. and those are good points. We get asked that question quite a bit. Uh, we fish mostly with 10 foot, six weights at least. Uh, for yeah, the most part. Nine and, and a half tens. Yeah, nine and a half foot ten. Um, and we have a video coming up that shows catching cutthroats on that hang, the last yeah. trip that we had. That uh, Again, it was I, I could feel the point where uh, that extra foot was helping me get a little bit more to where that hang was just right at the end of it, and the fish were hitting it right there. Right. So it made a difference. Yeah. One of the things that I will mention, though, is um, – and we're going to talk about like different boats, um, different methods of positioning your boat. But we fish a lot out of the bass boat, and there are certain reservoirs or, or lakes that we like to just kind of use the, the trolling motor and bang shorelines, right? So even though these fish aren't huge, huge fish, we'll fish a like a nine foot seven or a nine foot eight weight because it's all just you know quick casting action cast out strip 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 if they're not eating it within the first you know 15 20 feet of your retrieve you pick it up and you cast again you know 10 or yeah. 15 feet more because you're pounding banks yeah so it'd yeah be, it'd right. be much like a river situation yeah, yeah. like fishing streamers in a river so you know um in fact i got roasted the other day because i posted a picture of three rods rigged on the boat one was a How dare you mouse rod a leech rod and a minnow rod mm -hmm. you know so anyway sounds great there are some times where you you might want a, a nine footer but you could certainly hit the banks like that with a 10 foot yeah and you can now. you know just like all things that our last video you know is a is a thousand dollar fly rod worth it yes there are advantages to it you don't have to have a thousand dollar fly rod to catch fish and this is also true here you don't have to have a 10 foot six weight or seven weight to catch fish in still water but we think that if you get into it, you'll tend, you'll gravitate towards those types of rods. Okay, so let's talk about now, um, you know, real selection. Probably there's there's not a lot of uh, dark arts that go into to selecting a reel. I would say um, choose one that you can get spare spools for that are rather inexpensive. Yeah, like the lamps and liquid or remix. Those are, you know, fairly entry level reels that are of a high quality, but they're awesome because you can get a whole bunch of different spools yeah. for those. I think the, and they come in the three pack as yeah, well. Yeah, right. important. So we sell a ton of those and they're just convenient because you get a reel plus two extra spools. So basically three line holders in one pack. Yeah. That, and you're almost set. I mean, we'll talk about lines a little later, but, um, reels when it comes to reels you tend to have you'll accumulate either reels or spools right and so you, but if you're like curtis you buy i don't mess around with <laughs> spools yeah i look at his rods he's got like brand new ross evolution what's the most expensive one no you got some animus right no uh, evolution R. Oh no, yeah. how dare you so 
He, That's I, absurd. He wouldn't look something his, as slow as an animus. I'm using the, the Orvis. Awesome? Uh, yeah. I'm using the Orvis Hydros, and I really like that because it's like they're, they're it's a good good reel. You can get yeah. the spools fairly cheap, but freaking Curtis, he's going all rich people stuff on us. <laughs> and Lance is a Lamson fiend. No, I, I just I have lots of their spools and reels. That's what and, I'm saying. Yeah. That's what. The, the, I'm not. I have lots of Ross reels too, or other brands, but I do use I use Lampson's a lot in Stillwater. I have a whole fleet of their uh, reels and spools. I think it's important to point out, like you said, the spools are a big deal. But if you're buying spools, it's important to make sure you have probably a backup frame or several frames uh, for a couple reasons. One, if you end up like I have with you know more than a dozen spools of some sort, and and then your frame takes yeah. a dive, uh, you're out of luck. So it's nice to have some backups. It's also nice to have extra frames because, you know, if not all of us can afford 14 different fly reels, no. But uh, so if you if you wanted to rig more than one rod, just having one frame and a whole bunch of spools doesn't help. But if you had a whole bunch of, you know, let's say you had a floating line, a midge tip, a three, five, and a seven, or something like that, and you had two frames and you had two six weights, you could put the floating line on one frame and the yep. type three line on another and have two ready to go in the boat. Uh, that's so that's another reason to have a couple of extra frames and a, have a frame that's durable that, that's long lasting obviously like all things in fly fishing you want to get the best you can afford you can certainly yeah. catch a whole bunch of fish in still water on a you know what's a good example we sell the echo base is a good example of that plastic looking composite reel that's $35 and you can get spools that are really inexpensive it's not the most durable reel but it would get you fishing yeah, yeah. sure we do have one comment says I'd start looking, I'd be looking at starting off with a 10 foot four weight. I think a four weight's going to be tough to cast in the wind. Yeah. Well, and you'll have some struggles with uh, some fish, I think. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you can land them, but it, we're, I just. We're generalizing too. I yeah. Mean, yeah. So if you went to a. Like a high mountain. Yeah, a high yeah. mountain lake where the fish are, the 12 inch fish is a really big fish, you probably don't need a 10 foot six weight. But just generally speaking, lakes, you're dealing with wind, you're dealing with, you know, two or three flies, you're dealing with large flies, long casts. That's something we didn't cover on the rods. Yeah. Casting in still water is a big deal. Everybody argues that I can cast good enough to catch fish on the river. I even don't have to cast past 35 feet, right? Well, you don't to catch fish. In a river, you'd still catch more if you could cast farther than that, but that's and beside accurately. the point. And accurately. Yeah. But if you cast on 35 feet on a still water and you're in a float tube or a boat with a trolling motor, 35 feet away, those fish know you're there. You're just yeah. wasting your time. You're soaking your flies in water that the fish have already been scared. But if you cast 60, 80 feet out there, you're yeah, going to show flies to a lot business. more fish. And the other thing with a four weight, uh, which is would be fun, mm -hmm. you're limiting on, you're limited on, on lines. Lines are very hard to get in still water of the four, and you're limited on fly size, you know, all things being equal. Some people can do things with a four weight that others can't, casting wise. Yeah, sure. But still, um, you just, you know, four weight, generally speaking, the reason that uh, he said that is his handle was love to nymph. So a nymph would be a great four weight. Yep. Or a good hopper uh, rod. Probably be a good nymphing rod, but, but <laughs> not necessarily a great still water rod. Not for general situations. Okay, now. Um, in my opinion, this is maybe one of the top three most important things that you need to get dialed in is your fly lines. So back when I first started, you know, I had my floating line. So I went into a shop and I said, okay, I need a sinking line. Mm -hmm. And they, they kind of looked at me like, okay, well, what do you mean? Like what, what type of sinking line? So there are, you know, a hundred different types of lines. And I think everybody kind of has their favorites. Um, when I go out in my pontoon boat, I usually like to have three lines, depending on what I'm going to be doing. In the bass boat, I'll take eight. But maybe we can talk about maybe your favorite or top three or four lines that you like to fish in still waters. I know for Lance, that might be hard to dial it yeah, down. Yeah, three much. or four would be hard. That's yeah. limiting. When you're in a competition, though, how many are you taking on a boat? Mm, usually twelve. Yeah, but you won't. You don't very often use all those. It's just if you're in a competition, you're you're usually in a boat with somebody else, and you need to catch as many fish as possible. Yeah. So if I'm competing against one of you guys, and you have a line that I left on shore, and you're 
wrecking the fish with that, that doesn't work for me. Yeah. So I got to have them all out there. Even, you know, that said, it's rare to go through in a three hour session, even if you changed a bunch, you probably didn't change more than two or three lines. Yeah. But you, but you need to have them there. Um, mm -hmm. So for me, I, I like to have the midge tip. And we'll talk probably a lot about the midge tip because there's a lot of talk between or, or talk about indicators versus no indicators. And for me, the midge tip is the great equalizer when it comes to that. Um, but I like a midge tip. I've really been liking fishing the parabolic line where it's a type three and then a type five in the middle of the line and then a type three at the tip. So your flies are kind of going in a sweeping motion. And then other than that, like a really fast sink line, like a, the triple density Titan taper mm -hmm. sonar line, the, the three, five, seven. So it's, it's three densities of lines that'll get straight down. Um, that's kind of my favorite. What would you say, Curtis? Um, yeah, so <laughs> probably, you know, it depends. I mean, if there's dry fly possibilities, I'd, I'll take a, I'll always have a floater. I mean, that's always on the boat. So you look for every excuse you can get to put a bobber on. <laughs> I haven't used a bobber in a while. He, I know. he did used to. I don't know if that's true anymore. Right. But, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll have a floating line for dry flies. And if I have to use an indicator, I will. And sometimes, very rarely, but I will still. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would say midge tip is a good one uh, or like an intermediate uh, clear camo or something like that uh, that doesn't sink that much but you can control where your flies are by virtue of the fly weight and distribution as well as your countdown which kind of applies to almost any line and then depending on what's going on I'll probably have a type three or five or the parabolics a fun one too um, I, I wish I could swim underwater and see what that line does as I retrieve though that yeah. it's like we need to figure that one out but yeah um, yeah, so those floater, kind of an intermediate-ish or midge tip line and a, some sort of full sinker. So the keys here are when you're looking at sinking lines, um, if you see a type one, how many inches per second is that? Roughly Did, one. Roughly one. Then you go, the, the, the higher the type of line, the faster it sinks. So if you just use that as kind of a gauge or if that you just put that in your knowledge bank when you start looking at fly lines and going to go to buy new fly lines that's a good way to to gauge um, how you know wh which fly lines lines to buy um, also typically the the higher end fly lines are the ones that are really super technical like you're gonna pay like what 90 bucks or yeah so. mm -hmm. um, but you can get like an intermediate or a type one two three four for, like know, the SA air cells. Yeah. Yeah. The wet cell. Wet cells. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The wet cell. The wet. <laughs> so let's let's dive into the midge tip. We've talked about it quite a bit. Um, we've done videos on it. We've we've done a lot of uh, you know fishing with the midge tip, and let's let's just kind of talk about what it is, how to set up the leader for the midge tip, which the leader setup is is very versatile for other lines as well. And then uh, we can talk about, you know, fly selection as well. Can so, we can we back up on line selection? Oh yeah, for yeah, a second? absolutely. Sorry, so the 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 one thing that's on there that I don't think we really cover very well is how many lines should you have. And I right. we talked about different lines, but why why would you need them? You know, obviously we'll, we get people that say, Well, why can't I just use a type three if I want to fish deep, I just let it sink longer. And you can, but then you're going to let, you know, you're, you're going to waste half of your day waiting for your line to sink to the proper depth rather than having a type five or seven to get to that depth quickly. And then other people will say, well, if I get a type seven, then I don't need the intermediate or the type three because if I just don't let it sink very deep, then it, it stays shallow and comes back, which is kind of true, except it keeps sinking and it fishes very deep at the end of retrieve anyway and you have to move flies really quickly to keep them shallow. Uh, so that doesn't always work. Fish don't always want your flies moved really fast. So you kind of need yeah. a, a range of lines. I think, uh, you know, we talk about this with customers a lot in the shop. I think kind of the, 
the core lines you should shoot for would be a floater, a midge tip, an intermediate, a three, five, and seven. So that's a lot of lines. And you maybe don't have to have all of those. Uh, but I think if you're going to get into still water, that's a pretty good standard set. Uh, then if you start adding technical lines like sweep lines, you can get sweep lines in three, fives, and sevens. You probably don't need all those. You could just get that parabolic, which is basically a sweep five or a, a parabolic five. Uh, but it's nice to have lines that I would what I wouldn't do is get like a type an intermediate and a type 2 and a type 3 and a type 4 and a type 5 because those gaps are not very big right. so it's nice to get a you know two four six or three five seven or something like that so you're skipping you don't need every single sink rate just skip some of those you know you have your bases covered from floating line midge tip intermediate three five seven yeah, yeah. You cover various depths and uh, various speeds that way too. No, and that those are really really good points. So I mean, um, like we were talking about before, if you buy one Lamson three pack, you can stick three lines on that right mm -hmm. now. You know, yeah. and that that's a good starting point. Um, okay, so midge tip. Um, I'm gonna let Lance tackle this one. Or unless you want to talk about it, Curtis. I don't even know what they are. Yeah. So, and <laughs> sure and just so you know, the the Rio one's called a midge tip. Airflow makes a midge tip. The one that I fish the most, I think you guys fish a lot too, is the SA Emerger tip. Mm -hmm. Is what what it's called. That's true. So, Lance, tell us what that is. The midge tip is basically a floating line with a. It's a sinking tip line, but it's an intermediate sink that's very short. So we, when people ask about it in the shop a lot, they're confused. They say, well, isn't it just a sinking tip line? Yes, it is a sinking tip line, but it's shorter than most sink tip lines and or less dense than most. You know, most sink tip lines are designed to fish streamers on rivers uh, where you're fishing a floating line. And then most sink, sinking tip lines that are available now, you can find some that are five footers, but most of them are 10, 12, 15 to 25 foot sink tips. And the midge tips are usually three to six feet. Uh, Airflow makes some three footers. The SA Emerger tip's a five footer. The Rio midge tip long, in touch midge tip long is a six foot tip. And they're all intermediate tips, so they sink very slowly. So you, the advantage to them is that they, one, they cast well, they're designed to cast teams of flies. Two, they cast out and they have the majority line on the surface, so it stays pretty, uh, the flies can stay very shallow, but they also can fish very vertical. So you could use a midge tip to fish horizontally very shallow, or you can fish weighted flies and fish the mid, let the midge tip actually sink down, but the floating portion of the line makes it pull back up. Mm -hmm. uh, there's all kinds of techniques we could talk about as far as you know, a washing line with a booby or a fab on the point and unweighted flies between with the short sink tip to keep flies really shallow. You could fish a bomb chronomid or a balanced leech on the point and a tungsten chronomid in the middle and a brass beaded chronomid on the top and fish quite deep. Yeah. Um, you know, the line itself, though, is really versatile, and I think that's why we tend towards them a lot. It allows you to fish really shallow. It also allows you to fish very deep. The one thing it doesn't do is it doesn't pull flies horizontally at depth. It pulls them. It kind of holds them at depth and lifts them up a little bit and drops them back down and lifts them up and drops them down. So you're fishing a more vertical approach with the midge tip rather than horizontal when you're fishing deep. Yeah, and so another thing about the midge tip is when we're fishing this midge tip, and, and my usual go-to with the midge tip is with the heaviest weighted fly on the point, five feet up, a less weighted fly, and then at the, the top fly, another five feet up the leader, I'm fishing an unweighted fly. Mm -hmm. So that that's something that, that we should cover as well. Um, with With this line, we're typically running a section of 20 pound fluorocarbon with a nail knot tied to the line. Mm -hmm. We're get cutting that loop out because you're having to strip that through your guides when you're landing fish. Mm -hmm. You So 20 pounds, then 15 pounds, so that's what, three feet yeah, usually? Mm -hmm. To a tippet ring. And from that tippet ring, those five foot sections or six foot sections between your flies are all the same diameter of, of tippet. So it's just all three X, okay? So by doing that, you can attach three flies on, really small nymphs, and you can fish a vertical presentation just like an, an indicator, but you don't have to use an indicator. You're, you're in direct contact with your flies. You feel it when the fish eat it, um, but, but that's one of those vertical presentations. 
um, when, when, I, when we explain this in the shop or online or whatever, people seem to say, okay, so you're fishing, you know, 15 to 18 feet of nothing but 3X, that's mm -hmm. not gonna cast. Mm -hmm. And- It's not easy to cast. It's not, e yeah, it's not easy to cast. The midge tip line helps with that a little bit. It's designed for teams of flies, as you said. Um, also, the heavier your point fly is, the harder it is to cast, in my yeah. opinion. And if it's a balanced fly, even worse. <laughs> oh, yeah. I hate balanced flies. Yeah, balanced flies, the, trying to pull them out of the water column is pretty hard. There's a reason why all the balanced flies on our YouTube channel are Curtis's, <laughs> not mine. But anyway, that's, that's kind of the, the general setup for a midge tip line. Um, so you're going to take that, cast out as far as you can, let your flies get vertical or to whatever depth you are, and just kind of slowly retrieve it with some pauses. Sometimes they'll want it a little faster, sometimes they'll want it just dead slow. And you don't have to see the tip of your, your line go down or anything. It's, it's just an instant grab. You yeah, feel, feel everything. So that's another thing. It's the, the lines are very low stretch, right? Yeah. You hit, you feel the taps, you, you know when the fish are yeah. on. You're usually going to feel yeah. the pluck instead of see it. You can, in really uh, calm conditions, you might see the, the slight bit of curves in your line straighten near the end. But right. in most situations, with a little bit of wind or a little bit of chop, you're just going to feel the line come tight. Right. You know, it's funny because in one of our videos, we did an experiment where they made me fish an indicator mm -hmm. while everyone else was fishing a midge tip. Mm -hmm. And the reason we did that is because we could see the fish down there. We could see them actually eat the fly. Um, and so we were casting out, and we did this the trip before too, but we didn't catch any of it on video. But we were casting out and you would watch fish fly, swim over to your fly that was under a, a bobber and they would eat the fly and spit it out before the indicator would even move. Yeah. And that happened almost on every single cast or on, on every single time the fish ate it. And then they would, one would come by or they'd, there'd be two fish competing over it and they'd hit it harder and that's when you'd see the indicator go yeah. down. Well, and but. speaking of, so, I mean, obviously a lot of people like to indicate uh, fish and it's not, there's nothing inherently wrong with it. Uh, no, not at all. We've done it for years and I always have indicators with me. Um, I don't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I think one of the things that you, you get from the midge tip, and I, I mean, I know people sometimes might get tired of us saying midge tip, midge tip. It is a very versatile line, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I have found the fact that you're not, as opposed to a full sinking line, which is more of a horizontal presentation, having that ability to go from horizontal, if you want, unweighted flies, maybe a shorter leader, uh, to really sinking vertically and then retrieving. Um, but I mean, going on with what you said on the indicators, um, that's not, that wasn't the first time that I had uh, indicators uh, you know, prove to me that I was missing so many fish. Mm -hmm. uh, a few years prior to that, I was fishing uh, an area of a lake that had a little bit of a uh, inflow from a stream. So there's a little tiny bit of current. I could see the fish in there. I had my indicator. I knew how deep the fish were, relatively speaking. I could see the fly. The water was super clear. And so I could just kind of mark that fly. Because it was a dumb chimera with a bright orange bead. Well, right? it probably was. I mean, jeez. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and I would see it disappear. And I'm kind of watching for the indicator to see, you know, if a fish took it. And, and, or maybe it was a fish that came in front of it. And I wasn't getting any indication on my indicator. And uh, I ended up getting, uh, you know, I knew the fish were eating something. And so I let it get down there a few more times and then instead of looking at the indicator I just watched the mouth and I could see the mouth open and I'd set the hook before the indicator even moved and that kind of became the theme on that where the indicator was just not um, it, it wasn't quick enough to mm -hmm. telegraph the, the hit. Now on the flip side we have a couple years ago we had a time where uh, we knew exactly where the fish were holding mm -hmm. and with whatever lines we're using at the time, it wasn't getting to them exactly. And so I just put the indicator at the exact depth I knew the fish were, first cast, let it get down, and then pow. So, you know, we're, we're not downplaying indicator no, fishing. Time and place. But I would say, in my experience, that uh, 
I'm catching usually more fish with a midge tip, uh, just because of the versatility. Yeah, we and like you say, we're not the, we're not here to tell you that you should never fish indicators because there's times and places where that's the best technique for yeah. sure. An indicator is a better rig in a lake to suspend flies at a very specific depth and just hold them there, or fishing a very small area, uh, fishing holes and weeds yeah. that are not you know a big expansive hole, just a something that's you know 60 feet or less across where you're not going to be able to cast and just pull yeah. flies through it uh springs where you you know you want flies in a very specific you know a 10 foot circle and you don't want them to move you don't want them drifting through there the indicator has an, an advantage as far as uh it's a disadvantage initially but when the indicator hits and the flies hit it could spook fish yeah right but because it will suspend f flies there you can it could actually spook fish and then have them you know one minute, three minutes later, come back, yep. and you haven't disturbed the surface where casting a midge tip over and over and over in the same place could have the, mm -hmm. the opposite re result. But anyway, it, like you're saying, uh, I think it's much, to me, it's much like Euro nymphing. Uh, the more I learn about the midge tip and the more I learn about Euro nymphing, the less I use indicators in both rivers and lakes. Yep. There's still time and, times and places where that's the best, you know, where an indicator is your best friend, but it's and it's not something you want to, you know, totally eradicate. You want to learn how to do both, but I think you'll you'll be like most that we encounter, and you'll gravitate towards the indicator less rigs. Yeah, you know, and and that's that's one thing with with those um, with the midge tip as well. It's like we're not trying to force you to do it, but you should give it a try. You know, try something else because you you know Curtis and I thought, yeah, we're we know how to fish chronomids. We have it dialed. And then as we learned how to do these new techniques, our, our still water game just went through the roof. And yeah. the roof was very low, I guess, because <laughs> we're, we're still learning a lot. We're always learning. We're all going to do that. I think yeah. there's two more things I want to touch on with the, just regarding the midge tip. <clears throat> One, that is that the line itself is not inherently, it's not magic. The line, you have to have the proper setup still that, <clears throat> that Cheech was just described very well as far as the leader setup. But the reason the leader setup is mostly tippet is not to make it hard to cast, it's so that it sinks better. Um, if you ran a taper leader, you you know, in that r same rig, it's not going to perform as well. You have way too much butt section in a standard taper leader to allow those lighter flies to sink. Yep. So I know we find uh, people naturally don't like casting long leaders. So when we tell people, we've even been, been on lakes with some of our friends before, where we tell, they get a midge tip, but they don't like to go the three flies, they don't like to go the super long leader, and you don't have to fish three, you can fish one or two for that matter, but you do need to have most of the leader be tippet to allow the flies to get to the depth that you want, assuming you want to get them deep. Uh, so that tippet part of it is is on purpose. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the reason for that. The other thing is, uh, much again like Euro nymphing, you need to have a, a selection of weighted flies to make the midge tip work, or also floating flies. So like we mentioned earlier, to be able to fish really shallow, you gotta have either all unweighted flies or even buoyant flies like foam, you know, booby-eyed flies or uh, fab that has the foam butt, the foam arse, as they say. The, uh, I'm telling your wife that you're swearing on the that's podcast. That's all right, she's used to it. So then you have those to keep you really shallow. On the flip side, to get really deep, you again have to have those crazy heavy flies to help change your depths and everything between. It's, you know, we talk a lot about balance leeches or chronomid Frenchies or whatever. Uh, I, I know you guys are just like me. I have my confidence balance leeches. I have them in various bead sizes to get to different yeah. depths. And my confidence chronomids, I have them in various bead sizes to get to different depths. Uh, usually just tungsten so that I, I tie them all tungsten so I can see in my box, this fly is tungsten, that fly is that tungsten, this fly is tungsten, but all of them have a progressively larger or smaller bead. It's really easy to tell the big bead's gonna sink the fastest and the smallest bead's gonna sink the slowest then you can adapt your rig to whatever situation you might encounter. And I might even say, you know, as, and we're going to move into this now as well, and we're talking about the fly selection. Um, I would say that the, the weight of your fly when fishing these techniques is almost more important than the pattern. For sure. Because yeah. if it's not in the zone, they can't eat it. Again, right? just like nymphing a river, right? You right. got to have the, it's not about the pattern so much as having the right presentation, having it at the right depth. Drifting right. the right speed or moving the right speed, retrieving the right speed. Yeah, absolutely. And midge tips, we should mention, usually the right speed is way slower than most people think. Yeah. Listen to Phil Rowley and Brian Chan talk about their naked technique, which is basically much like a midge tip, but just with a floating line. And they're talking about, you know, 
one inch strips yeah. and hand twist retrieve that's really slow. Mm-hmm. Most your, your natural inclination is to move stuff too fast. So as slow as you can stand usually. Right. Yep. Um, yeah, so with flies and, and presenting the flies, um, the, the first bullet point that I wrote down, which I was laughing at myself, is life after crystal buggers. <laughs> no, Not life, after. life after all of crystal buggers. Life with crystal buggers and other patterns. Right. No, I, the reason I wrote that is because that, for me, that was like, that was the one pattern in my box that I knew it would catch fish if I just cat, cast out and did the, the kick and twitch. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Mm-hmm. But, and then, you know, we have a lot of people who, who come in and say, oh, I'm chasing big fish. I need some big articulated streamers. And I don't really like fishing articulated streamers in, in lakes very much, mm-hmm. except for last mm-hmm. Friday. <laughs> no, no, so that, that's a different story. I mean, we have fish that are eating minnows, but typically I'm not going to fish articulated streamers in lakes too much. Uh, but what what do you guys do, Curtis? You you've got some cool lake patterns that you've come up with. But what what goes into fly selection for you? Um, I mean, I'm I'm probably largely driven by a bit of a match the hatch. You know, if, at certain times of the year, I know fish are keen on chronomids. I'll I'll fish a, a whole team of chronomids, and there are some times where if you you know if, again if you're fishing three flies. Um, regardless of the line you're fishing, even you can fish three flies with an indicator. <clears throat> mm-hmm. But um, I like to mix up maybe some colors. Um, so if I'll do chronomids earlier in the season, and, and I found at least uh, as the season goes on, and get calabatus, you get damsels, dragonflies, uh, leeches are always important. There's a lot of things. Um, then I'll, I'll start to kind of mix those into the teams that I fish. Uh, but I'll usually always have some sort of chronomid, unless, I don't know, like last week, didn't really need a chronomid, mm-hmm. the fish were king on leeches pretty good, we dialed in the color um, to the end of the day when we were fishing two of the same pattern, at least, I, I don't know if you were, I was, oh yeah, you mixed them up a little I bit. I was trying to throw minnows against your, <laughs> your leeches. That's right. I kind of got schooled for a little. But yeah, I mean, there, there's a, <clears throat> uh, um, it, it depends. I mean, there's some lakes that have sow bugs in addition yeah. to like scuds, um, crayfish, crayfish. Yeah. So, and I think one of the things when, at least when I started getting into still water more, you know, leeches and buggers, leeches and buggers, that's kind of the thing that we're, uh, it, it's Especially probably if you're a troller. Yeah. If we're the kick and twitch, mm-hmm. which I, when I first started, that's kind of how I did. You just get in your float tube or your pontoon boat and you kick backwards and throw your line out and you just you just let your line down and wiggle the tip and get a whole bunch of line yeah out. and then you you kick twitch a little bit and you never have to reel in this fly fishing is real easy you just throw your line out there and you just wiggle it out there and let it all out and then you start to kick it it's called trolling and you limit out in 10 minutes <laughs> hey that can work it can also be terrible yeah right and it, it can be a little boring i guess uh in a way but for me the thing as far as fly selection goes that really transformed my experience was realizing that you know i mean leeches obviously imitate leeches and i think buggers can do that but buggers can also imitate other things like dragonflies and damselflies and crayfish and minnows Minnows, so uh, woolly buggers you know greatest fly styles in the in the world one of them but um but i think the thing that opened up to me was just knowing how much variety there are variety there is in lakes when it comes to chronomids and calabatus and caddis and scuds and you know damselflies dragonflies uh terrestrials it's man that's one thing for me i get get excited with stillwater because it's just there's so much going on Mm -hmm. and again usually you have the chance to lock into a toad a big fish Yeah. yeah And one of the things that I've been having a ton of fun with, and you guys have seen it, is uh, some of the English style flies, the fabs and blobs and boobies and like Dial box, those types yeah, of flies. Yeah, crunchers, that, you know, the, We were talking to, what's his name, Chris Reeves, not Superman, but <laughs> he's a guy from the UK, he's on the Whiting Pro staff. We met him at one of the Whiting rendezvous and I started picking his brain about stillwater fishing. 
And I went directly to the flies. I said, well, what flies do you, do you fish most? He's like, well, I always fish the same three. He's like, I'll change fly lines like four times before I switch flies. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so, um, and that, some people are, are more that way. But it, it, again, drove home the point that, you know, have a few confidence flies and then just dial in where those flies are in the water. Whether it's your fly line that you're changing or, like Lance said, have the different weights of the different flies. Um, lately, though, if I had to pick, you know, top two, top three, um, the, the Chronomid Frenchie, which is not called a Chronomid Frenchie, it's called the Silver Lancer. Um, that's debatable. That's debatable. <laughs> so that's, that's been probably the best Chronomid since Lance told us about it for me. And then the Soft Hackle Calabatus, we fish a lot of lakes with, with Calabatus. Um, those two have caught a ton of fish for me. And then, you know, when we're fishing for cutthroats, I throw in the baby fat minnow there. It's, it's been fishing really well for me. Um, but yeah, I mean, usually I just fish my own stuff, but the Silver Lancer's way too bit, way, way too good. We all tend to fish our own stuff, that's for sure. That's normal, that's good. <laughs> um, let's see, so, and I think we'll probably do a more like formal video on how to tie the leader, you know, what the midge tip line is and stuff. Cool. Yeah. At some point, right, Curtis? Yeah. I think, what are we at? 45 minutes. Yeah, we're yeah. Wow, man, we're cruising. Um, another thing, let's see. Watercraft. Let's talk about how to locate the fish first. Oh, okay. If you're going to a lake that you've never fished before, um, how do you locate fish? And Lance, you've had a lot of experience doing tournaments where you might have to go somewhere you've never fished. Um, how do you go about doing that other than paying the dude at the gas station? <laughs> There's always a gas station, huh? And that right. never works. Right. Yeah, most places I fish, it doesn't seem like there's a gas station for a long ways. Uh, how do you do it? Well, that's a hard question, but uh, generally speaking, you want to know water temperature. Uh, hopefully you've done a little bit of homework. There's a, maybe a little bit of information on that particular lake online uh, telling you, at, you know, it's maximum depth, it's surface area. You can look at a topo map and see what, you know, does it get deep? Is it very shallow? You can look at the topography around it and kind of gauge whether it's in a canyon, if it's one of our local reservoirs, or if it's a natural lake that might be much shallower, um, on and on. But water temperature is going to dictate a lot of that. Trout don't like really, really hot temperatures. So uh, living out here in the desert in the, in the middle of the summer, the trout are generally speaking going to be deep uh, versus when the ice first comes off the lake they're looking for the warmest water on the lake a lot of times, so they might be right up in the shallows. Uh, but that's, it's hard to answer that in, you know, just generally speaking, but those are things I'm considering. You might also look, you know, if you arrive at the lake, you watch, are you seeing fish rise? Because if you're seeing fish rise, they don't often come from 20 feet to take a midge on the surface and go back to 20 feet. They're, they're within probably at least, you know, depending on the clarity of the water, let's say the top 10 feet of water, most, most of the time, probably even shallower than that. Yeah. Um, look at where the fish are rising. Sometimes the fish are rising out over open water and not on the edges. Sometimes they're rising near the edges and not, not out over open water. That's telling. That would tell you, you know, if they're in the open water, then you know those are probably suspended fish and you might need to get to a certain depth. Uh, one of our favorite local lakes, uh, Strawberry Reservoir, has that happens a lot where the cuts and rainbows suspend, the cuts especially. They get over 50 or 60 feet of water sometimes and they're only 10 or 8 feet down. Uh, versus sometimes in the spring and fall, they get right up into the weed beds, and uh, and even some, you know early summer they can be right up in the weed beds. But you're looking for risers, you're looking for you know signs of fish, you're looking for uh, water temperature, and then after that just some experience. If you start to get experience on a lake, you'll find certain times of year they do certain things. And, yeah. But if you're if you're looking blind, you got to know t temperature because if you're you know if the surface temps are above probably, you know, the high 60s, let's say, 66, 67, 68 plus, the fish are not going to be near the surface. They may not be crazy deep, but they're not going to be up there because there's a lot less oxygen and it's uncomfortable. Um, One of the things we noticed uh, when we were fishing Friday is looking at temperatures. We, we moved to a pretty a, a spot on the lake that was pretty far away, mm -hmm. and it was like three degrees warmer over... Yeah. 
in the other spot and we we moved you know three fish they were nice fish but when we came back over to the spot that was cooler there were more fish there so even even small changes than that can really make a difference sometimes yeah and that's because it's it's uh, we're getting the end of summer right so they're looking for it's been too hot near the surface so they're looking mm -hmm. for that cooler water if that was spring or right before it's going to, to uh, late fall when it's right going to freeze then that would be reversed those fish might be in the slightly warmer water right true um last couple thoughts we talked a little bit about fishing dry flies you covered that pretty well um throw mice <laughs> you never know i mean uh the the mouse patterns um it you can get some aggressive takes if you want to have a little bit of fun usually on a day where the fishing's really good and you're catching a ton you know the fish are active maybe throw a mouse just and just fun. in general don't underestimate uh the impact of dry flies I yeah mean, yeah I've been really surprised mm -hmm. in... And not just Calabatus. Yeah, like big hoppers. Uh, again, talking about strawberry, we've done really well with hoppers and ants and uh, caddis, you know, and uh, mice, of course. But And that doesn't... I mean, there's... We could get into a lot of details with high mountain lakes and, uh, you know, why the fish key so much on... Um, terrestrials but uh, a lot of those fish are just looking up and, and so they'll take a dry fly in a lot of cases yeah if a lot of their food comes from yeah from the above. surrounding yeah from yeah. the terrestrial land then that's a big food source so don't count out dry flies don't count out dry flies okay so I think uh, as a final topic let's talk about watercraft um, and what are some of the options out there? Um, what do we use? What's the easiest way to get into still water fishing? Maybe let's start with that one. What's, what's the best way for somebody to get into fishing lakes who has never yeah. fished from a watercraft? So we got people coming in the shop all the time that uh, are totally new to still water. Um, they, again, it, it is daunting. You get to this body of water that's five miles long and two miles across or whatever mm -hmm. uh, you know how do you fish that and so the first fishing craft is your legs you know don't be afraid to walk the shore <clears throat> the fish there's usually always going to be fish within casting distance of, of the shore if you can make a decent cast from you know if there's <clears throat> not a wall of rocks you have to get on a cliff for those trees or swamp or something but line breakers is what we call yeah them. <laughs> line breakers and ankle breakers um, so yeah, don't don't be afraid to walk around. That's any any lake that you can get out. It's always worth trying. It's, that's when I was in college and did a little still water fishing here and there. It was always from shore. I never had a boat. I did have a diaper donut float tube that leaked crazy amounts. Uh, I could stay out on the water for like a half hour max, um, but it got me out on the sketchy. water. Yeah, yeah, it was sketchy. But um, yeah, so that that be first. It, uh, kind of up from there, I guess, float tubes in general, your pontoon kind of uh, personal watercraft, you can get into one of those for a couple hundred bucks and, and up. Yeah, like the, the fat cats are what, like 250 to 300 for a, a really nice boat. I fished out of them, I, I weigh like 480 pounds. <laughs> Plus or minus. Plus or minus. Soaking <laughs> wet. I'm glad you said that, Lance. <laughs> you're, you're reading my mind. But... Yeah, the, those fat cats are really stable. Um, but, yeah, that those are good. The, the, the pontoon boats, too, which are either frameless or not. You've seen Curtis, Lance, and I fish off of those um, when we go up into the high mountains. Um, Lance, you fished a fair bit out of a drift boat in lakes. Mm -hmm. What's your preferred setup for that? I mostly use a drift boat with an electric motor and a drogue, so we fish lock style, if you will, with the boat fishing sideways, so you're fishing out the sides of the boat, uh, and you're wind drifting more or less, but with the drogue or the sea anchor, sometimes they're called, it hangs out the, the back of the boat, so your, your wind, or sorry, your back is to the wind, and your drogue slows the boat down so you drift across a bay or across a weed edge or something like that, and that's the, that's the preferred method that way. And it's the ultimate stealth method, too. I mean, 
we use a trolling motor a lot, Curtis and I on the bass boat, uh, a lot of pounding shores, but we also have the, the drogue or drift sock on, on the drift boat that we, we've used a few times. And you can sneak right up on the fish. They don't know what's what's coming when you do that. Yeah, it's very different than trolling. You know, one disadvantage to the kick and twitch, the old the trolling in a pontoon boat is when the fish are a little deeper, it's okay. But when they're shallow, you're dragging your fly right where your boat and your motor or your fins just that went, where you're creating a ruckus, scaring all the fish away. So you just cleared a path for there to be no fish, and then you drag your line right through it. I'm amazed how often our anglers around here really struggle when the fishing I think is red hot on our lakes, but the fish are really shallow. Yeah. When the fish get down 10, 12, 15, 18, 20 feet, the trollers can do pretty well. When they're up right at the surface, they really struggle and they just don't seem to grasp why. Yeah. It's pretty yeah. obvious. You're scaring all the fish before you get a chance to show them your flies. Uh, this, the drogue allows you to fish ahead of the boat instead of behind the boat. So the only thing that they see first is flies and then eventually the boat gets to them, but you've already covered all those fish first. Right. And then uh, up from there is like a motor boat. So we have a bass boat with a Minn Kota Ultrex motor on it. It's got a spot lock virtual anchor system. It's insane to fish off of. It's it's a ton of fun. Should we tell them it's that it's called an Ultera? <laughs> no, it's the Ultrex. Is it? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah, 100%. Let's Google that. Google it right now. I'll bet you five bucks. Five bucks? I'm going to have to because I filmed it and edited that and I saw what it said. Yeah, the Altera, so I'm wrong. The Altera me, is a lesser model. Oh, it is. Yours the is the Ultrex. Yeah. Yeah. They make an Altera as well. Yeah, they make okay. an Altera. Okay. But you still lost the bet. I did. I lost <laughs> in front of YouTube. Dang no. It. But uh, you know the 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 disadvantages I guess to a bass boat is it, it makes more noise. There's more stuff to hang your line up on. Um, but the advantage, which we see as the biggest advantage, advantage I haven't lost yet, <laughs> is you can move across big bodies of water very, very quickly. Yeah, covering so water is nice. At altitude, I think we can do about 50 miles an hour on the on the white snake. That's the one. Ultra. Yeah, I knew there was an Yours Ultra. Yours is an Ultra. Mine's an Ultra. Yeah. Okay. Go on. It's money. Well, here's the other thing about boats, though. Bass boats is cheats gloats, gloats in victory. When you're a, wa a Raiders fan, you have to take your victories where you can get them. See, he takes shots like this any chance he can get. I outfished him once, too, and he couldn't handle it. You did? Yeah, just when I, when I caught one fish. Uh, at a, now, over the course of the entire day or for a few hours? We don't need to specify. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, just over checking. a few hours on one body of water. On one body of water. That I was, may or may not have true. landed the fish. A fish. Okay. Yeah. All right. You did. So what were we talking about? Uh, I was going to say boat. So here's the thing. Um, you know, bass boats or any other sort of motorized boat that would be fly fishing friendly. We're not competitive. No, not at all. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Don't ever port. put a challenge to Lance. He will not let it go. <laughs> There's a reason he does competitive. Challenge anyway. you to take all the cardboard boxes out. <laughs> <laughs> I take cardboard boxes out a lot more often than you do. I promise you I that. Challenge that you to true. clean the shop <laughs> Boom, kitchen. Boom, roasted. <laughs> <laughs> to clean the shop bidet. We do have one. We have one. I'm going to leave the uh, shop bidet cleaning to the people that that soil the <laughs> shop bidet, which uh, we won't mention those people, but anyway. They, but uh, his name rhymes with ma'am medley. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, we got a shout out to Brig. It's his birthday today. Brig, happy birthday. And, to and, he, and he set up our awesome backdrop. Yeah, he Brig did. set this yeah. up. Uh, he must have had a pretty tall ladder to get all the way up there. <laughs> It looks really good, though. For a guy that knows how to clog up the fast lane on the freeway, he puts up a pretty good backdrop. <laughs> he's a terrible driver. He's from he, Idaho. He's got a man bun 84% of the time. And uh, he's a stud. We love him. Very athletic. He likes good music. But, yeah, say hi to Brig, everybody. Anyway, talking about boats. <laughs> so boats, here's the deal. <laughs> if you were to buy, like you could go on your local classifieds or Craigslist. I don't even know if they still have Craigslist, but. Um, you'll find, uh, you know, like 14, 15 foot boat that's got a decent motor on it. Um, it's not a death trap if you get out on big water. Um, you know, I'm 
be careful with any boats, but uh, <laughs> we, we've had a couple of can be a death trap. <laughs> really <laughs> scary. Curtis really, and I really scary. trespassed in the name of staying alive once, where we had to beach a fourteen foot tin boat. Yeah, fourteen on. foot's getting sketchy. Yeah, yeah. sixteen. Yep. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> we see these fourteen foot, twelve, fourteen foot boats with out on four Strawberry people on with them. four people. I just man, th- that's gnarly. We've been through a couple of instances where. Yeah. You don't mess around. But anyway, point is, let's say you, you had a budget of a couple thousand dollars. <clears throat> you could find a used boat, a 16, 17-foot boat, um, even just like an aluminum boat, nothing fancy, a little outboard mm-hmm. with a tiller. Um, and you could even put your, your uh, you know, casting platform or something in. So you could, you could turn it into a decent boat. When all's said and done, you probably pay about the same for that as you would if you went to like a high-end uh, framed float, pontoon, frame pontoon yeah. put a trolling motor on it with a battery and you got to license it and you put all these things on it mm-hmm. so don't uh, overlook a, a legitimate boat because um, I, yeah. I know a lot of people that have gone that route and um, I mean our fast boat was only like eight grand yeah so I mean that's out of the bag it's, now it's not a super expensive <laughs> that bass was boat. before the Ultrex well <laughs> the old Terra Ultra. <laughs> yeah. But point is, you could, I mean, if you really wanted to get into it, um, the, the nice thing about a boat is that you're not limited to a space. Like in a pontoon on big water, you, you're kind of as far as you want to kick, unless you've got a little electric motor. Even then, you're not going to get out too far. Right. So it, it's just, a, it gives you more flexibility. You know what? A, a couple other things that we should, we should uh, point, touch on here is we get asked sometimes about stand up paddle boards kayaks and rafts oh, yeah canoes rafts canoes yeah and so <laughs> the the key to catching fish i think it's still water is your positioning um that's why lance uses the drogue that's why we have the trolling motor but if you can't fish at the same time you're controlling your boat you're basically just out for a boat ride it's going to be unless like, you're anchoring unless you're anchoring mm-hmm. for sure mm-hmm. so on a, on a kayak unless you have some way to control it some of them have the foot pedals but if you're having to control it with a with a paddle, is mm-hmm. that what they call them for kayaks? Kayak a paddle, paddle, yes. Um, you're either paddling or you're fishing, but usually not both. If there's a lot of wind, uh, stand up paddle boards even worse. You know, it's it's going to be really tough to to get really serious about holding position and fishing from a stand up paddle board. Um, Keeping in mind we're talking about trout fishing in a lake. Right. Because it, it could true. be used for other things. But. Yeah, I mean, and there are definitely instances where those are, are phenomenal fishing craft, you know. Um, but, and then rafts as well. I mean, if you have a raft that has oars, unless you're anchoring, you're going to have to have someone always on the sticks posi- positioning yeah. where you go. Yeah, a raft with a motor mount would be okay. You could attach a drogue to a raft. But, um, like a... If, you, if it's just you going out, that's where I think pontoons and float tubes really come in handy. And I did make a note here. Yes, uh, I saw that. I don't know. Yes. Yeah, there it is. Yes, you need fins. You need fins. Yes. That and is a really common misconception. They think they're getting out of a float tube to a pontoon because they want the oars. But if you made, if you, you had to choose tomorrow, you're fishing out of a pontoon boat, would you guys choose to leave your oars home or your fins home? Oars, oars, every time. Right? I, there's one time that I needed oars, and I had them, and I ended up losing a fin in the mud. <laughs> but, I yeah, there's no question. Yeah. So and fins propel you backward. So yes. that's another thing. Also, if you rig a trolling motor on your pontoon boat, <laughs> make it so that it makes you go backward. You can steer with your fins. Um, just because yeah. you like to see where you're going so doesn't mean you should The reason go you need to have fins, you mentioned, but you, just to clarify, you can't control the boat with oars and fish because you can't have your hand on the rod. So you, having fins on, you could still use both uh, oars and fins. You can row to the part of the lake you want to get to because mm-hmm. the oars are faster than the fins. But you get there, and then you, you stow the oars. You know, you stick them up so they're out of your way, and you get the fins in the yeah. water, and you put your back to the wind, or you put you keep a specific distance from the bank or from a weed bed or to a certain depth, and you hold that position. 
in a boat you would want to anchor or double anchor really so that your boat doesn't if you just have a single anchor in a boat your boat just sways back and forth it'll drive you crazy yeah so, that's that's another good point is having an anchor both in the front and the back if you're going to do a lot of still water fishing where you can anchor that's that's definitely a, a way anchor. to do it yeah, but you definitely, uh, if you're in a pontoon boat, you know, flow tube, obviously the fins are the only propulsion, but on, in a pontoon boat with the oars, you need the fins. All right, so let's see. What else, fellas? Well, wow, we're over an hour already. It goes fast. Okay. Yeah, so at the end of the day, try out still water fishing. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. We like our subscribers. Yeah, and mash the bell so that it gives you notifications even when we accidentally start live streams we don't mean to so. <laughs> yeah try still water it's a great thing to do in the shoulder seasons it's awesome in the spring when all the rivers are high from snow melt and they're blown out you have you have uh, you don't have to just sit at home tying flies you can go still water fishing when it's the hatches are over on the rivers and you've had you're just you're sick of all your regular river haunts it's just right when still water gets picking up in the fall again it's a great thing to do. Yeah, so you know how to reach out to all of us uh, on the social medias or uh, come in the shop, but we, we definitely uh, have a lot of information on Stillwater and gear. So come check it out. Thanks for tuning in. Thank See you. See you next time. Later. <laughs>